The Law of Success, Lesson 12, Concentration. You can do it if you believe you can. This lesson occupies a keystone position in this course for the reason that the psychological law upon which it is based is of vital importance to every other lesson of the course. Let us define the word concentration as it is here used, as follows. Concentration is the act of focusing the mind upon a given desire until ways and means for its realization have been worked out and successfully put into operation. Two important laws enter into the act of concentrating the mind on a given desire. One is the law of autosuggestion, and the other is the law of habit. The former having been fully described in a previous lesson of this course, we will now briefly describe the law of habit. Habit grows out of environment, out of doing the same thing in the same way over and over again, out of repetition, out of thinking the same thoughts over and over and when once formed, it resembles a cement block that is hardened in the mold, in that it is hard to break. Habit is the basis of all memory training, a fact which you may easily demonstrate in remembering the name of a person whom you have just met, by repeating that name over and over until you have fixed it permanently and plainly in your mind. The force of education is so great that we may mold the minds and manners of the young into whatever shape we please and give the impressions of such habits as shall ever afterwards remain. Atterbury Except on rare occasions when the mind rises above environment, the human mind draws the material out of which thought is created from the surrounding environment, and habit crystallizes this thought into a permanent fixture and stores it away in the subconscious mind where it becomes a vital part of our personality which silently influences our actions, forms our prejudices and our biases, and controls our opinions. The great philosopher had in mind the power of habit when he said, We first endure, then pity, and finally embrace, in speaking of the manner in which honest men come to indulge in crime. Habit may be likened to the grooves on a phonograph record, while the mind may be likened to the needle point that fits into that groove. When any habit has been well formed by repetition of thought or action, the mind attaches itself to and follows that habit as closely as the phonograph needle follows the groove in the wax record, no matter what may be the nature of that habit. We begin to see, therefore, the importance of selecting our environment with the greatest of care, because environment is the mental feeding ground out of which the food that goes into our minds is extracted. Environment very largely supplies the food and materials out of which we create thought, and habit crystallizes these into permanency. You, of course, understand that environment is the sum total of sources through which you are influenced by and through the aid of the five senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and feeling. Habit is the force which is generally recognized by the average thinking person, but which is commonly viewed in its adverse aspect to the exclusion of its favorable phase. It has been well said that all men are the creatures of habit, and that habit is a cable, we weave a thread of it each day, and it becomes so strong that we cannot break it. If it be true that habit becomes a cruel tyrant, ruling and compelling men against their will, desire, and inclination, and this is true in many cases, the question naturally arises in the thinking mind whether this mighty force cannot be harnessed and controlled in the service of men, just as have other forces of nature. If this result can be accomplished, then man may master habit and set it to work, instead of being a slave to it and serving it faithfully, though complainingly. And the modern psychologists tell us in no uncertain tones that habit may certainly be thus mastered, harnessed, and set to work, instead of being allowed to dominate one's actions and character. And thousands of people have applied this new knowledge and have turned the force of habit into new channels, and have compelled it to work their machinery of action instead of being allowed to run to waste, or else permitted to sweep away the structures that men have erected with care and expense, or to destroy fertile mental fields. A habit is a mental path over which our actions have traveled for some time, each passing making the path a little deeper and a little wider. If you have to walk over a field or through a forest, you know how natural it is for you to choose the clearest path in preference to the less worn ones, and greatly in preference to stepping out across the field or through the woods and making a new path. And the line of mental action is precisely the same. 
It is movement along the lines of least resistance, passage over the well-worn path. Habits are created by repetition and are formed in accordance to a natural law, observable in all animate things, and some would say in inanimate things as well. As an instance of the latter, it is pointed out that a piece of paper once folded in a certain way will fold along the same lines the next time. And all users of sewing machines or other delicate pieces of machinery know that as a machine or instrument is once broken in, so it will tend to run thereafter. The same law is also observable in the case of musical instruments. Clothing or gloves form into creases according to the person using them. And these creases once formed will always be in effect notwithstanding repeated pressings. Rivers and streams of water cut their courses through the land and thereafter flow along the habit course. The law is in operation everywhere. These illustrations will help you to form the idea of the nature of habit and will aid you in forming new mental paths, new mental creases, and, remember this always, the best, and one might say the only way in which old habits may be removed, is to form new habits to counteract and replace the undesirable ones. Form new mental paths over which to travel, and the old ones will soon become less distinct and in time will practically fill up from disuse. Every time you travel over the path of the desirable mental habit, you make the path deeper and wider and make it so much easier to travel it thereafter. This mental path-making is a very important thing and I cannot urge upon you too strongly the injunction to start to work making the desirable mental paths over which you wish to travel. Practice, practice, practice. Be a good path-maker. The following are the rules of procedure through which you may form the habits you desire. First, at the beginning of the formation of a new habit, put force and enthusiasm into your expression. Feel what you think. Remember that you are taking the first steps toward making the new mental path, that it is much harder at first than it will be afterwards. Make the path as clear and deep as you can at the beginning so that you can readily see it the next time you wish to follow it. Second, keep your attention firmly concentrated on the new path building and keep your mind away from the old paths, lest you incline toward them. Forget all about the old paths and concern yourself only with the new ones that you are building to order. Third, travel over your newly made paths as often as possible. Make opportunities for doing so without waiting for them to arise through luck or chance. The oftener you go over the new paths, the sooner they will become well-worn and easily traveled. Create plans for passing over these new habit paths at the very start. Fourth, resist the temptation to travel over the older, easier paths that you have been using in the past. Every time you resist a temptation, the stronger do you become, and the easier it will be for you to do so the next time. But every time you yield to the temptation, the easier does it become to yield again, and the more difficult it becomes to resist the next time. You will have a fight on at the start, and this is the critical time. Prove your determination, persistency, and willpower now, at the very beginning. Fifth. Be sure that you have mapped out the right path as your definite chief aim, and then go ahead without fear and without allowing yourself to doubt. Place your hand upon the plow and look not backward. Select your goal, then make good, deep, wide mental paths leading straight to it. As you have already observed, there is a close relationship between habit and auto-suggestion, self-suggestion. Through habit, an act repeatedly performed in the same manner has a tendency to become permanent, and eventually we come to perform the act automatically or unconsciously. In playing a piano, for example, the artist can play a familiar piece while his or her conscious mind is on some other subject. Auto-suggestion is the tool with which we dig a mental path. Concentration is the hand that holds that tool, and habit is the map or blueprint which the mental path follows. An idea or desire to be transformed into terms of action or physical reality must be held in the conscious mind faithfully and persistently until habit begins to give it permanent form.